Um, I'm going to give a talk today about uh, diabetes and how it affects uh, people's eyes and how we can try and preserve people's vision. So um, diabetes is an incredibly uh, common disease um, and it's basically where the body just cannot regulate its own blood sugar levels. And this blood sugar, kind of coarsely describing it, it coats everything in your body. Every protein in your body gets covered with sugar. And that protein can't perform its normal function because it's crystallized with sugar. It's not really crystallized, but just think of the sugar affecting every single part of your body. And so here we see uh, a diagram showing multiple systems in the body that are affected by high blood sugar that is uncontrolled. Uh, diabetes is an incredibly common disease. Uh, it occurs very commonly in developed countries. We have tons of sugar. Our government subsidizes sugar. It's sugar is not something that's hard to find. I'm sure we've all found plenty of sugar in the back table tonight. So it's something that we, it, we live in a time of, of no scarcity when it comes to sugar. You think about diabetes and civilizations as, as, um, as they were developing, sugar was a rare commodity. It was, it was a luxury, it was like gold. And nowadays we're all eating gold on a daily basis. It's very common in, in, in our lives. And so, uh, being a multisystemic disease, it affects the eyes. And so, um, is that important? Well, I invite anybody to watch the rest of this presentation with your eyes closed. So, uh, this is a photograph of the, uh, of the freeway, and, and driving down the freeway, I need to be able to read signs and see cars coming from either side. And uh, I, I show it because the eye is similar to a camera, but not exactly like a camera. At the uh, front of the camera, uh, you have uh, lenses, and those lenses are intended to uh, focus light onto the film, and then you get a negative image. And so uh, the retina and, and within the eye is this paper film tissue at the back of the eye, where the cornea and the lens both combined focus light onto the film of the eye, the retina. And the retina creates an image like this, which is a little bit different from the, eye, the image that you might see from a camera. On a camera, Everything over here and over here and over here and over here is an equal focus. Whereas in the retina, we have incredibly high resolution focus in the center and we lose focus in the periphery. And again, I invite you to try and watch the presentation by looking over there. You won't be able to see what's on the slides that clearly. And so in the central vision, diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration are the diseases that commonly affect this part of the visual field. And in the peripheral parts of the visual field, where everything is less high acuity, these are, this is a part of the uh, visual field where glaucoma predominates. And cataract is a film over the entire visual field. I just want to recognize our chair who just walked into the room, Dr. Barry Cooperman in the back, uh, who, who uh, leads the Sci Institute. So uh, when talking about diabetic eye disease, just like how it affects all parts of the body from the lungs to, the to, to your toes to your eyes, diabetes affects all parts of the eyes. And so you can have dryness on the surface of the eyes that is uh, accentuated by diabetes. You can have cataract formation, which is where the lens inside the eye becomes opaque. And you can have diabetic retinopathy, where the film in the eye, the film in the camera, stops working. So for cataracts, Normally, light is able to enter the eye very easily and get to the back of the eye. But over time, as the lens becomes more opaque, light cannot enter the eye. And therefore, light can't enter the camera and touch the, the sensor or the film in the camera. You can't take a picture. And there are many different grades of cataracts, basically starting from a clear cataract down to a very dark cataract. And so we can look at this in the clinic and we can see what the lens looks like. This is an angle of light shining through the lens inside an eye. And we can see that as the lens becomes more opaque, light cannot penetrate the eye. And over here, you can see that the light's only touching the outside of the lens, but not actually entering the lens. And there are many different types of cataracts. And diabetes is a disease state that accelerates the formation of cataracts. Cataracts can make night driving terrible by making the view, field of view have a lot of glare versus no glare without a cataract. And cataracts can take a really vibrant, colorful world and turn it into a blur or turn it into an ashen landscape with no color. So cataract surgery is the most commonly performed surgery in the world. It's the most commonly performed surgery in this building on the, on the ground level. And, uh, 
And so what happens in cataract surgery, well, first off, we've talked about how light can't enter the eye easily uh, with a cataract. With cataract surgery, we need to remove this lens and replace it. And that's done by opening a small window at the front part of the eye, uh, front part of the, uh, the lens, removing the lens, and replacing it with a clear plastic lens. And so that fits into the eye just like that. And that's the new lens that you have for the rest of your life. And that offers clear vision as long as the retina is functioning well. But I'm a retina specialist. I've done cataract surgery several hundred in my, in my career. But I don't do cataract surgery anymore. I did one two weeks ago, but that's the only one I've done in the last four years. So I focus on the film in the camera, the retina. And so how do I examine the retina whenever I see a patient? So again, the retina is this paper film, paper thin film in the back of the eye that covers the whole inside of the eye. And this is a wide field photograph of the retina. And so this is actually 200 degrees. This is a very sophisticated camera. That, this is 180 degrees right here. This actually takes an image behind itself. It's amazing. It's, it uses light to, and the, and the eye's uh, optical apparatus to focus light into parts of, the, of the, uh, the eye that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see very easily. And so what we see here is this is the optic nerve. It connects the eye to the brain. This is the central retina. This is the fovea. This is the part that you're all looking at right now and seeing fairly clearly. And this is the peripheral retina. And so all of this, all this tissue around in the periphery, and in the, in the uh, macula and in the fovea, is sent through the optic nerve back to the brain, and that's how we see. And so the macula, which diabetic retinopathy reduces vision, age-related macula de degeneration reduces vision, that's the central part of the visual field. And then glaucoma affects the periphery out here. So when we look at the retina, and we zoom in on this little area right here, it has a foundation, and it actually has the retinal tissue itself. And there's a blood supply underneath the retina that brings oxygen and nutrients to the retina. And there's a blood supply on top of the retina. And the blood supply on top of the retina actually dives into the retinal tissue and brings oxygen and nutrients to the retina and takes away toxins as well. And so we have the technologies uh, now using scanning laser cameras to take images of the retina in cross-section. This is actually the fovea, the central part of your visual field in cross-section. That's only about a half, micron, a half millimeter to a millimeter in diameter. This is a really tiny area. And in fact, the retina is only about a quarter of a millimeter thick. So if you think of those tiny little tick marks, the smallest ones you've ever seen on a ruler, it's a quarter of that thickness. It's a really, really thin tissue. And here we can see the optic nerve diving back and sending all that information from the retina to the brain. So this is a photograph of my eye. And if we focus in on the macula, and then zoom in even further, you can see the fovea. And you zoom in even further, that's the fovea again. And you zoom in even further, and we look under a microscope, we can look at the blood vessels flowing in the, in the retina. Diabetes is a blood vessel disease. That's at least how I describe it. It's probably a little bit too much of a, of a contraction of the, uh, the enormousness of its, di of its um, description, but it's a disease that makes all the blood vessels in the body not function the way that they should. And so this is actually, these are the blood vessels from a dog's retina. And what we see here are normal capillaries. You see these uh, very small blood vessels that allow single blood cells to flow through them. They have a nucleus that's kind of long and stretched out. And then you have some other nuclei, which are these very small circular nuclei that are other cells. At the end of the day, the thing that you should, should know is that these blood vessels are lost. The little round cells on the outside are lost, and the capillary can't allow blood to flow through it. So if blood doesn't flow through something, the tissue can't survive. And also here is a, what we call an aneurysm, a little outpouching of the blood vessel where blood can get trapped and there's really no good flow either. So this is what diabetes does to the eye. And we can see that when we take an, uh, an animal's eye, we digest out all the retinal components and only look at the blood vessels. This requires destroying a tissue in order to actually see it. We can zoom out and we can see many more microaneurysms, a lot of blood vessels that just aren't functioning anymore. And we can zoom out even further uh, in, in this image of a dog's retina. Well, if we look at the retina in a healthy person, this is how it should appear. And we have the technology now using scanning lasers to actually look at these blood vessels uh, without anything more than a scanning laser. And so this is the normal appearance of the fovea. 
This little area right here is responsible for your 2020 vision. This is your half micron of functional, everyday, highly useful vision. And then outside, this is also still in the macula, very highly useful, high acuity vision. And here's a patient with diabetes, very severe diabetes. You can see that this picture looks very different from that picture. And if we look at the fovea, we can see how there aren't any blood vessels in this living human's eye. This is a, from a living human's eye without any kind of you know, knives or anything to cut the tissue out and take a look at it. It's looking with a scanning laser. And so we can actually look with very high resolution at the function of the blood vessels in the eye. Like I said before, this fovea, this little dip, that's that is the area that's responsible for our ability to read and see faces clearly. And we can image that very clearly using the scanning laser. And in a person with diabetes, there's a lot of fluid that accumulates in that central part of the vision. And the, it's, it's kind of like a wet sponge. And we can actually look at the architecture of the retina uh, in somebody with severe uncontrolled diabetes. And you can see that there's no comparison between the two. They're very different in appearance and also function. So people lose vision. They, see, they do see, but they don't see clearly. So 2020 is kind of what we aspire for. Typically, that person with, with a fovea like that might see somewhere in the order of 2060 to 2400. In other words, only able to see the big E on the chart. We can also use other studies where we can inject a dye into the arm and let that flow through the, f through the whole body, and we can see the dye in, in the retina. So all these previous slides have only been looking at the small area here, but we can see the high entirety of the retina out here. And in someone with diabetes, you see a huge change as well. Blood vessels not working, new blood vessels growing, and ultimately high risk for vision loss. And some of the newer technologies, which are not mainstream just yet, are able to do this without injecting the dye into the arm. So the, these technologies are coming down, the they're coming down the line. This is an image showing someone with a different disease, a vein occlusion, which is like a stroke of the eye. It has similarities to diabetes, and this bottom part of the retina is not affected, the top part is. So diabetic retinopathy is divided into uh, two major categories. The non-proliferative type, where new blood vessels are not growing, and the proliferative type, where, the, where there are new blood vessels. And in non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it's a range of severity, going from mild to very severe. And in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you can have proliferative and high-risk proliferative. Basically, high-risk means you have a very high risk of losing vision, possibly in a permanent, irreparable way. Once you've gotten to proliferative, it's very likely that some vision may have been lost irreparably as well. So here's a picture of a mild diabetic retinopathy. It's probably difficult to see, but there's a few little red spots that show areas where the blood vessels aren't working normally. As we go through the, the progression of diabetic retinopathy, you can see how these pictures change tremendously. And so people go from having few little red splotches to many red splotches to new blood vessels, and then finally bleeding inside the eye. And those new blood vessels can scar, and they can tear the retina off the wall of the eye. In fact, people who have a very severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy can progress to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. 45% uh, of them occur in one year. Yeah. Question, is there a correlation between A1C and your and the severity that you're showing up there? So that the duration of A1C being elevated, so that if, if you have a high A1C for a very long time, then certainly you can have a, uh, a, a rapid progression through the stages of diabetic retinopathy. So there, there is an association. So the, there, there can be changes. You can, go, you can progress forward through the, through the disease, or you can actually revert. And so it depends on people who are controlling their blood sugar very well. They can go from severe or very severe back to a mild form of the disease. But people who don't control their blood sugar very well, they can rapidly progress. And actually, people who are pregnant and have even mild disease can progress to severe or uh, high-risk PDR within a, a few months. So. Um, it, it, there is some fluidity in terms of progression depending on control of diabetes 
um, during, uh, during this time course. 15% of people from severe diabetic retinopathy, non-proliferative retinopathy can go to proliferative as well within one year. So how do, we, how do we manage these patients? Well, the first and most important thing that every physician, uh, nurse, care provider should be doing is counseling people on controlling blood sugar and blood pressure. These are both equally important when it comes to proliferative retinopathy because blood pressure, well, blood flows through blood vessels and this is a blood vessel disease, so we need to make sure that the blood vessels are under as little stress as possible. People with any form of diabetic retinopathy should have regular eye exams. The lower the stage of the, of the disease in the eyes, the less frequently, you're, less frequently you're examined. The higher the stage of the disease, the more frequently you're followed. So a person with severe uh, or very severe will be seen every three months at least, and a person with mild will be seen every nine months. People with proliferative disease are probably seen monthly until the disease is controlled. In all, stages of the, uh, in all stages of this disease, you can consider injections into the eye, where we inject a small amount of medicine into the eye to try and control the disease state. In people who have pro progressed to this very severe stage, you can start to consider laser, but you definitely provide laser to the people who have proliferative disease. And in people who have bleeding inside the eye, it's a high consideration for surgery to try and uh, rehabilitate vision. So the treatment options are broadly categorized as injections, laser, and surgery. For injections, we're putting a small gauge needle directly into the eye under anesthesia. It's no more painful than having a tooth pulled or having a, a root canal. Yeah, you have a question? How often are injections required? It depends on, so the question is how often are injections required? It depends on the activity of the disease. If it's a very active disease, then more injections are required maybe every month. If it's a low activity disease, then possibly don't need to have an injection more than a couple times a year, or hopefully long term, none at all. So that's always the goal is to try and, you know, I always tell my patients, my goal is to get you not to be here as much as possible. Not because I don't like them, but because no one needs to spend their life sitting in front of me. So the injections, um, it's basically try to cure or trying to make sure it doesn't get any worse? So if people have lost vision, the goal is to try and rehabilitate as much vision as possible. Of course, we always want to prevent things from getting worse. So the injections, the goal is to try and, one, number one, restore vision as much as possible, but also prevent progression to permanent vision loss. So it could have both, okay. Yeah. So here's a patient actually that I cared for uh, starting in my first year of residency, which was back in 2012 up at USC. And this was somebody who came in with uh, severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. We see this laser scanning image, it's very swollen. This is like a topographic map that shows us how thick the retina is. It's, I describe this as the snow on top of the mountain. This is the mountain, and it's very thick, and there's snow on top of it. And the idea is to try and get that mountain to melt away. And so you can see, going from March 2013 to February 2014, um, we were able to establish essentially a normal foveal contour, a normal foveal anatomy, the central part of the vision normalized. And further, over um, a few more months, we were able to try and get this even more normalized. And this person had a restoration of their vision. They were uh, most likely seeing around, around 2,400 here. And over here, they're probably seeing about 2,040. So 10 time improvement in their acuity. So we can, and this is very common, we can restore people's vision in this context with injections and uh, following the patients very carefully. So if the injection goes on for a year, and So that's the question is, if, if the injections are ongoing for a year and it's not getting better, if we're talking about diabetic retinopathy, and to be clear, we use the same medicines as we use for macular degeneration and for retinal vein occlusion in diabetic retinopathy. Um, so uh, if someone's not getting better, um, it could be because they have no blood flow in their fovea, in which case they may not actually be getting better visual acuity. But the most important thing um, is to consider all aspects of, of the patient's um, uh, presentation to us. So we look at the numbers, the visual acuity. We ask them, how do you think you're doing? Do you think you're getting better? Is it, are we helping you? Then we look at the, these fancy uh, images, and then we take a look inside the eye and make a determination. Based on those four things are the key, uh, the key elements to making that decision as to whether to include uh, continue injections or not. So uh, another treatment option is this laser. And this is 
reserved for people who have proliferative retinopathy, people with new blood vessels that can bleed very readily and that can form scars that tear the retina off the walls of the eye. And so this is actually a, a picture of me performing a laser um, for a patient at one of our free clinics. Uh, the retina faculty here volunteer at a, a clinic called Serve the People. It's on Saturdays, actually. The Saturday I'll be there um, where we help people who don't have uh, insurance. And so in this, in this case, um, uh, I'm providing laser to try and prevent permanent vision loss from proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And so we use this laser to actually make little burns throughout the retina. And here's a, a, a diagram from the New England Journal of Medicine where, where this was initially presented, where we see somebody's optic nerve here. You can see all these feathery little small blood vessels around the optic nerve. And after laser, you can see some little laser scars probably over here. Those little feathery blood vessels have melted away. They're no longer causing as, as much of a threat to vision loss. So historically, lasers have been used for decades now. The injections have really only been uh, the mainstay for about 15 uh, years or so. Um, and so uh, here's a patient of mine who uh, presented um, with uh, severe uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. 2020, the fovea was completely normal, but you can see all these new blood vessels that are leaking on the angiogram. These, these blood vessels are seen over here. And so um, after uh, some uh, laser therapy to the peripheral retina. It's hard to see on this projection, but there are little laser spots throughout the periphery here. The disease became less active. It never goes away completely in terms of these bright leaking spots, but there are much lower risk of the patient actually losing vision permanently. And the final option is surgery, where we actually remove scar tissue inside the eye using pencil lead sized instruments to try and remove um, the, the scars from the surface of the retina as safely as possible and also remove any bleeding inside the eye. Bleeding inside the eye is like trying to look through muddy waters. You can't see through muddy waters. So the idea is to try and, and remove the blood so that patients can see again. And so this same patient that I showed you previously initially presented uh, with 20-20 vision. You can see all the little hemorrhages throughout the retina everywhere, these little red spots. These yellow spots are actually where there was leaking fluid and then it dried out and it left protein in the retina. And you can see on the angiogram here that there's a lot of white, meaning that the blood vessels are leaking the contrast agent into the retina. The patient came back uh, a few months later after not having followed up closely and had a major bleed in the retina. You can see the whole bunch of blood covering the retina. But still 2020. Why? Because the fovea is not obstructed. So this patient is able to, to read a book, drive a car just fine, although they do notice the hemorrhage. And ultimately that hemorrhage filled up the, the entirety of the eye. You could barely see anything on the angiogram. And even though he was still 2025, his visual function in that eye had declined significantly. So we performed surgery, provided laser. You can see these little spots in the periphery. And we can see the angiogram is completely normalized after, after surgery and the patient's seeing 2020. So um, that, you know, surgery is not something that we jump to willy-nilly, it's something we take very seriously, but when, when necessary, we're able to, um, to provide patients with the surgical option to try and restore their vision and rehabilitate it. So here's a 42-year-old uh, patient of mine who had uncontrolled diabetes. His um, left eye had blood everywhere inside his retina. This was back in 2018 in February. And then in March of, of 2018, we had done surgery and restored his vision uh, by removing all the blood and the scar tissue in his retina. This is a little bit difficult to follow, so I apologize if I made this too complex, but I want you to start at the bottom and kind of read backwards, the opposite of a book. This is where that patient was initially, 2400, had bleeding in the retina. You can't even take an image of the retina in either of these cases. Had surgery to reattach the retina and was given medication to get rid of the swelling underneath the retina and so it came back to 2040. And this is a 42-year-old guy who's working. 42-year-old guy who wasn't able to do his job because he had bleeding and scars in his retina um, and he wasn't able to do it for a number of years. So when we say that diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in a permanent way in the working population, we're talking about people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s, and 60s losing vision in a permanent way. And so in some instances, we're actually able to have these major successes and restore vision. Um, yeah. 
when you said this person have uncontrolled diabetes, that means it cannot be controlled or he just didn't seek any treatment for diabetes? Unfortunately, the, the majority of the cases is that uh, the patient wasn't uh, receiving, uh, wasn't pursuing care, um, which is not uncommon in, in the young working age population. They didn't know they have diabetes? No, they often do know, but it's, it's you know, when you're functioning at 2020 vision, no visual complaints, and you start having bleeding in your eye, that's the first time you know that you have a problem. But by the time you're having bleeding in your eye, your disease has progressed to a very severe stage. So th these patients, when they're uncontrolled, it's, um, in, in, in my understanding, and Dr. Chesler can probably comment on this more clearly, is it's not because they can't control it with medication and diet, but it's because they um, have actually neglected their own care. They choose not to. I, I don't know if it's a choice, they just prioritize other things. And you know, they think about the working population. Um, you know, I'm the worst case scenario. Um, I, I would neglect everything to take care of family and to, to, go, to work and try and, and do all those sorts of things. So it's very easy um, for people to neglect themselves um, with diabetes. Question, how do you define control of diabetes? So uh, there's a number of ways that one can describe control. So, so you know, A1C, like you asked about earlier, is this long-term descriptor of the, the, about three months of how well the blood sugar is controlled um, over that whole time. Whereas you can also check your blood sugar at, at any moment and know if it's within the normal range, uh, <laughs> below 125 or below 100. Um, and, and so control ultimately is having your blood sugar controlled sufficiently so that you don't have complications, so that you, you don't lose sensation in your toes and get, develop an ulcer and have your leg cut off, or you don't develop retinopathy like what we're seeing here, or so you don't have a heart attack or a stroke. Um, these, these are all uh, major complications that develop from diabetes, um, but in general, the goal is to prevent complications by su controlling the blood sugar sufficiently uh, to prevent those complications. So um, in terms of newer thoughts for diabetic retinopathy, with these injections, there, the, the, some of the agents that are used for treating diabetic retinopathy have been approved for non-proliferative disease or even people who haven't lost any vision. In other words, people who might have retinas that look pretty darn good. Um, and that's to reduce the appearance of diabetic retinopathy when we look inside someone's eyes. I don't typically treat people uh, in, in that context uh, with injections because with injections you have the risk of the worst thing, which is losing your eye. I've never had it happen but it, 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 the probability exists for anybody who ever has an injection. And we take extreme precautions to avoid any kind of infections in the eye. It's a very serious thing. But there are certain people that it's really worth having the discussion with and taking the risk. For example, this is a um, poorly spelled female, which is, uh, uh, that was, uh, sorry about that. I, I did actually go to medical school, but somehow that, that slipped through. Um, a 31-year-old female with type 1 diabetes who, um, who actually uh, presented with 20-20 vision. And this is how her, her uh, scanning laser images appeared. But she wanted to have a child. And so I can tell you that I've seen numbers of people, um, you know, we talk about people who don't receive care. It's someone who's receiving care for just trying to bring a, a new life into the world. And uh, during pregnancy, people with diabetes, they're, they're uh, Blood sugar is very difficult to control, and the retinopathy can, can spread like wildfire. So these are rare instances where I might treat the earlier forms of diabetic retinopathy. And so this is actually her uh, images. Fairly normal, except for some of this dried out fluid, uh, this protein left in the retina over here. Um, and it's very difficult to see the little red splotches in both eyes. But this image hi highlights a little bit more easily. This is a different type of photograph that highlights these areas of bleeding where you see these little black spots throughout the retina. And so this person, uh, she received two injections, and in March she came in and said, I'm thinking about having a family. I said, okay, well, we're, we're done giving you medica this medication, and I'll watch you carefully while you're pregnant. Because the medication theoretically could cause harm to a developing embryo. 
And to, to show you the difference between the two, I mean, it's such mild retinopathy to start off with, but I wanted to get her back to the earliest stage possible so that if she did accelerate during pregnancy, we'd have a lot more room to work with. I don't want to be doing surgery or injecting medications in someone's eyes when they're pregnant because there are risks associated with that. So what we can see here, um, putting these little circles, if you look at this area right here, and you look after two injections, you can see that the number of little red splotches have, have, have reduced. Um, and in theory, this is a, a lower stage of disease um, and maybe a little bit safer for a pregnant person. So in summary, diabetes affects so many people throughout the world. And um, uh, it's a multi-systemic disease and it has many different stages that can cause permanent vision loss uh, in people. And there are several different options for, uh, for treating with injections, lasers, and surgery. Um, but really, we should be always be talking about prevention. Prevention is the most important thing. And that's actually where practices like Dr. Chesler's and other, other primary care doctors and endocrinologists, where they help to control people's uh, blood sugar and blood pressure, um, is the, the sight-saving treatment. The future um, of diabetic retinopathy, at least what we're trying to pursue here, is through translational medicine. And so the question, that right now, people who have a, a scanning laser image like this receive a couple injections, they can look like this, a little bit better. But if this person's seeing 20, they don't, 2020, they don't necessarily want to take the risk of having a needle put into their eye. So are there options for taking a pill instead? And so um, combinatorial pharmacology or systems pharmacology is basically taking, looking at all the drugs that are available at CVS or Walgreens or Target or wherever you go and see if they manipulate certain parts of the body certain proteins in very subtle ways and taking a combination of very low dose medications putting them together so if you're taking a blood pressure medication you take it at such a low dose that it won't actually change your blood pressure or if there's a, a Parkinson's disease medicine you take it at such a low dose that it doesn't actually change your movement as it would for Parkinson's but this combination of blood pressure and Parkinson's medicines can be put together at very low doses subtherapeutic for the other diseases to try and modify the disease course. And so uh, we have a series of clinicians and scientists. Um, Tim Kern and Chris Polchesky are two of the newest people here. It's the biggest names in the field um, with uh, myself and, and Barry Cooperman. We're, Barry Cooperman and I are, um, are both clinician scientists. In other words, we see patients and we do research as well. And then our retina service, which are these five people. And putting the combination together, we're going to be doing a clinical trial, trying to help people who have 20-20 vision, 20-25 vision, 20-30 vision, who have a retina that looks like this, and by giving them a low dose of medication from not, uh, avoiding going to the FDA, uh, avoiding having to get permission from the FDA to use a new drug, using the, these drugs at such low doses that maybe we can actually prevent vision loss uh, in people long term. And so that's where I think uh, we'll be going, is avoiding having to stick needles in eyes, avoiding to have to put lasers and burn the retina, um, and hopefully avoiding having to do surgery, which is a little bit counterintuitive for a surgeon to say. Uh, so we, we are looking to start this basic science translation to clinical trial. And um, I'll take any questions if there are any extras. Exactly right. So that, that's a great question. You know, the question is what, what happens to the body's function when you have these very short time interval changes? And the technologies that we have right now, uh, at least in ophthalmology, aren't able to detect those changes. Um, uh, we are developing new scanning laser techniques actually across the parking lot to look at tissue function in the context of disease and how that changes with and without treatment or even changes like fluctuations in blood sugar. Um, you know, the, the analogy that I always share with my patients is um, it's fine to be lowered slowly from a three-story building, but if you jump from the roof, you're going to break your legs. So these fluctuations can be okay if they're not occurring too rapidly and too frequently. Um, but in general, we like to uh, have as little fluctuation as possible in the body. Yeah, so these blood vessels, they aren't normal blood vessels. They're structurally very weak, and whenever we move our eyes, just you know, looking around the room, as we sweep our eyes across the room, the gravitational forces that rotate the eye are higher than anything else in our body. Our eyes move so quickly, and the jelly inside our eyes, 
actually tugs on the retina a little bit. I'm sure somebody in this room has had a floater at some point in, in their life. That's where the vitreous jelly finally separated itself from the retina. It doesn't necessarily always mean a problem, but it, it tells you that uh, the, the, the jelly is attached to the retina, and when it pulls on the retina, uh, you can start to see floaters or you can see flashing lights. But if, you, if this jelly, as it's rotating quickly through in the eye, starting and stopping, tugs on a weak blood vessel, the blood vessel uh, bleeds very easily. That's a, that's a very good question. So um, the similarities between diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration, um, they're completely different disease states. However, they do affect the central vision in many instances. And the macular degeneration, um, it, in, its, in its typical definition, has a dry and a wet form, where the wet form has actually new blood vessels that grow and bleed as well. In a different location than what we see in diabetic retinopathy, but still there's bleeding. The dry form of the disease is a slow progressive loss of the foundation of the retina. And so the cells that turn light into electricity can't do that job anymore. And so um, what we end up having is in the central part of the, of, the, of, of the field of view, the cells that support that part of the field of view slowly die. And they progressively die over time. And so the only thing that we can do right now is, based on a large study of thousands of patients from, by the National Eye Institute, where they looked at, um, at high-dose vitamin um, and antioxidant and nutritional supplement um, therapy to slow down the progression of the dry form of the disease and the conversion of that dry form to the wet form. In terms of, uh, so th th these supplements do a good job of actually slowing that down. Not as good as we would like it to be. And so for s advanced forms of the dry disease, there are some newer therapeutic agents for injecting into the eye that are being investigated. And so we are actually actively enrolling patients here for treatment of the advanced form of dry macular degeneration to try and slow down the loss of the, the cells that support the central part of the visual field. Um, so right now, in terms of mainstay therapy or mainstream therapy, there aren't any therapies um, that are uh, injectables, but we're hoping that there will be. And at UCI, we're also uh, investigating retinal transplantation, where we try and, uh, and restore vision by putting new retina in the place where the retina has died. Um, and so actually in two weeks from tomorrow, I'll be doing a surgery in a rabbit and trying to restore vision in a rabbit. Uh, using one of these retinal transplants, but that's probably five, ten years away um, for implementation in, in humans. Theoretically, yes, but no. We're, fortunately, we've, we, we're, we're constructed in a way that minimizes that risk. Uh, however, you know, you, you could get into a car accident or you could go, bu go bungee jumping and uh, have a higher probability of causing uh, damage to the retina just because of the g-forces that are that, that can occur in those high impact events but even football players they do have retinal detachments every now and again but it's not something that doesn't that stops people from being able to play football i i don't have sufficient scientific evidence to support doing that in people who don't have intermediate or more advanced macular degeneration I don't take supplements. And my, my father did have macular degeneration. Fortunately, uh, the majority of people uh, don't develop diabetes. Um, however, it is about 7 to 9%, um, even in the developed world. And so, um, in order to prevent complications from, well, in order to prevent developing diabetes, it's good not to have a diet that's solely fast food, high in carbohydrates. Um, so if you're eating only potatoes, noodles, rice, tortillas, and all these sort of things that are only carbohydrates, then um, you have a higher probability of being exposed to lots of sugar that you can't uh, control over time, and then you develop di diabetes. Um, but in general, moderation is important for people in general, uh, even if you don't have diabetes. But people who have diabetes, they should not eat these high carbohydrate foods. Um, in order to make sure that they can control their blood sugars and not progress from the early to the advanced forms of the disease. No, no, we, all, we need to have sugar in our diet because that's actually what creates our energy. 
but it's a it's it's kind of like a, a gentle dance trying to figure out how much sugar it, you can consume and then also take the medication so that your blood sugar stays within a normal range so um, you know in, in theory a lot of people who have type 2 diabetes they can completely resolve their type 2 diabetes by diet and exercise uh, however type 1 is it's difficult much more difficult to, to control and, and requires insulin um, in order to control the blood sugar and we just that the idea with the, what you consume is you can minimize the amount of medication possibly necessary uh, by consuming less carbohydrate but we all definitely have to have carbohydrates in our diets otherwise we can't make energy and survive So the, the, that clinical trial is actually in design right now, so we're not actually enrolling or screening people. But um, if, if people have uh, diabetic retinopathy with um, swelling on their scanning laser image, then um, they should let, let their doctor know. Um, and, and then we'll put you on a list and, let, and then contact you when we actually start enrolling people in that trial. If there are people from, from the community, um, then uh, are you a, a practicing ophthalmologist or? Yeah. So if, if there are people in the community, okay, so if there are people in the community who want to want to participate in it, then um, I would encourage them to, to come and be evaluated uh, to see if they, if they have um, diabetic retinopathy and see if they would qualify for this trial. But right now, this trial is actually at kind of the earliest phases where we're trying to get permissions to run the trial because we have to make sure we do things safely. Uh, for all human subjects involved. But right now we're not actively enrolling that, in that trial. Yeah, macular degeneration typically is something that occurs um, in Caucasians. Um, it occurs in more in blonde-haired, uh, blue-eyed Caucasians and occurs more in women than men. Um, however, it does occur in, in people from, of other um, racial groups, uh, but it's much more common in, in, in um, Caucasians. So. Uh, in order to prevent developing the severe form of macular degeneration in general, everybody, no one should smoke because that's the, the biggest uh, modifiable risk factor. Uh, the other things are, you know, having a good healthy diet and, and lifestyle, you know, not eating lots of processed foods, not eating, you know, only red meat and, and all these sorts of things, but actually eating lots of green leafy vegetables um, uh, and uh, doing everything in moderation. But um, unfortunately, uh, cigarette smoking is um, lots of people have come blind uh, because their, their macular degeneration progressed much more quickly as a consequence of it. Yeah. it you know, but it's, it's actually not unique to macular degeneration. It's true of, of everything that we do. <laughs> so um, at the end of the day, we, we, food is just so easy to come by. Uh, it's a good problem to have, but it's also a really bad problem to have. Uh, in the developed worlds, which is why things like diabetic, diabetic retinopathy is so severe in the developed world. Um, but yeah, in general, for all, all systems in the body, we just need to do things in moderation. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>